Well, good morning again. It's great to be with you this morning. I've always loved that song. Uh, both of those there. I don't know if you've heard the first one by um, the Getty. It's just a really great song about um, Christ is risen. And kind of as we kind of keep this theme going that we've been concentrating on the last few weeks with kind of walking through the last couple chapters in John and kind of showing how Jesus has uh, appeared to a lot of different people and what it means and what's going on behind the scenes there. And this morning we're going to be looking at kind of another appearance. We're going to be looking at John 21 and how um, Jesus appears before the disciples um, as they're fishing and, and he cooks them breakfast. And so we're going to talk about breakfast this morning. So um, if you're kind of, if you've got those juices flowing in your stomach and you're thinking about what you're going to do for breakfast, I apologize, but that's what the text is talking about, breakfast. So we're going to be kind of focusing on that this morning. Well, I hope you're doing well. I have a, a few announcements to make before uh, we begin the sermon. Um, the women of the Word are going to continue their having their Bible study on Thursday. So Thursdays from 11 a.m. to um, 12 p.m. in the cafe here. Um, everyone's more than welcome. Um, and it, it, you can start whenever you want for you know the come uh, for the women, and uh, they're going to be walking through the study, which is about the essentials of effective prayer. I can't think of a better study than having it on prayer. So that's going to be a really um, great time for. Them. And if you haven't um, been connected in that yet, please make sure you talk to Terry Laporta, who is, is leading that study. Second, um, as I, I addressed last week, we're going to be having a special congregational meeting on Sunday, April 25th. So next Sunday, um, after the service at 11.15, we'll be having a kind of a congregational meeting on some things, talking about some stuff. You probably um, got the email that was sent out this week about that. So we'll have uh, more conversation about that. Finally, um, I heard, uh, actually it was yesterday, um, that Graham Peacock, one of our missionaries, um, had a tumor removed in his colon. Um, they're not sure yet about chemotherapy and what the options are going to be. Uh, now, the Peacocks, if you don't know, they work um, in South Africa with the Independent Faith Mission. Um, and so there's been, they've gone, and gone through quite a bit in the last couple of years with everything going on. So just be praying for 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 Graham and the family as they um, go through this next stage of uh, what to do in terms of um, th this tumor. Also, I encourage you um, to look at the bulletins with all the announcements that we have, and uh, those are also sent out through the, um, the email that goes out on Sundays afterwards. So one of the questions that we'll be dealing with this, this morning, kind of the start of our time together in the sermon is, what is your favorite meal of the day? Think about that. What is your favorite meal? What things that you have that you are your favorites? One of the things that my dad used to do with me anytime I had a friend over was ask my friend and embarrass him by saying, you know, what's the favorite food that your parents make you? And so it was kind of getting, a, and they would, you know, get all red in the face and have to address that. Um, but the funny thing is that breakfast is one of those amazing meals that's so very important. And some people don't like breakfast. Some people skip breakfast because they don't like it. Now, me, I'm a huge fan of breakfast, and the fact that I'm not 400 pounds living right next door to, you know, pig, when pigs fly is, you know, kind of by God's grace because they've got some great breakfast food um, as well. And, I mean, I could eat breakfast three times a day. I mean, there's nothing like having eggs and bacon and pancakes and toast and home fries and coffee to start your day. But if you have all of those things every day, it's probably not the best health choice. But every doctor that I have talked to have said that breakfast is the most important meal of the day. See, after your body fasts for a while while you're sleeping, you wake up and your body needs nutrients. And if you skip breakfast, what happens is that when, by the time you get to lunch, you get really hungry and you need to eat something. And so your sugar level spikes and you get kind of, you know, that up and down level throughout the day. And if you feel sluggish, it might be because you've skipped breakfast. Or maybe you eat the wrong things for breakfast. You have like, um, I, my friend used to have, you know, I'm not joking, chocolate milk with his cocoa pebbles for breakfast, and then we'll go to school that day and, and wonder why his grades were not so good. Also, they found that if you're hypoglycemic, if any of you are hypoglycemic, that if you, they found that if you eat something with high protein in the morning, it actually can really help with your sugar levels and make you feel a little bit more awake and give you energy. So something that has high protein. I used to eat eggs and um, peanut butter or a protein shake sometimes would be, you know, work best if you had that issue. Um, when I was playing soccer a lot, I played soccer as a kid on the traveling team soccer. We kind of 
traveled all over Pennsylvania. And I used to eat peanut butter and a whole wheat toast before soccer matches. That seemed to really help. And the days I skipped that and didn't have breakfast, I didn't do very well. Breakfast is an essential part of your day. And this text really talks about this time that Jesus appears to them and has breakfast. And has a very different breakfast than we can think of. And I've looked around some different cultures that have breakfast. Koreans um, uh, traditionally have what they call rice or soup or they'll have meat, kind of like a seafood or a fish or vegetables or kind of a array of side dishes for their breakfast and food. If you're born and raised in Latin America, maybe from El Salvador, you're going to have breakfast that would be like fruit or eggs or rice and beans or tortillas. Or if you're in a hurry, you might just have some pastry and some fruit and some coffee. And one of the things that for Latin Americans, the one thing they do not skip is coffee. They'll skip breakfast, but they'll have their coffee in the morning. Coffee is essential in that culture. I've tried a lot of different things for breakfast over the years, and I found that if you work construction, one of the best things to eat before you do that is to have eggs, rice and beans, tortillas, fruit, and coffee for breakfast. I can promise you and guarantee you that you will have energy until lunchtime. I've seen it happen. I've done it. But with all the things that I have tried for breakfast, there's one thing that I haven't really never thought about and have fish and bread for breakfast. Fish and bread. See, that's what the disciples had with Jesus during this third visit that Jesus appears to them, and they sit and they have fish and bread. And so here's Jesus, the resurrected, you know, king of the world, the Messiah, is actually sitting with them and having fish and bread. He cooks them a meal. But see, Jesus wasn't just kind of hanging out with them and having breakfast. Sometimes we read this text and say, oh, that's nice that Jesus would prepare them a meal, that he would serve them food, and they would sit and and relax and have a, a nice time together. There's more going on here behind the scenes. He had other things in mind in this passage. He used his time together with them to teach them a lesson And to also speak to disciples in very subtle ways. He was basically teaching them by serving them. The kind of message that they would have to bring to others. So we're going to be kind of continuing this greatest story ever told. And we're going to learn how the disciples learned um, that through a normal task, they learned through Jesus of just eating fish and bread for breakfast. They were being commissioned to bring the good news of God to the world and to proclaim this gospel to anyone they come in contact with. Remember, in 40 years, the Christianity, um, the faith grew from Jerusalem all the way to Spain, even into southern France. In 40 years, this message, what was going on here? Jesus was equipping them and sharing them and getting them ready to share this message. So if you're going to be, um, I'm going to be in um, John 21, starting in verse um, 1. We're going to look through verse um, 14. So it says here in verse 21, um, I'm sorry, in chapter 21, verse 1, it says, After this, Jesus revealed himself again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. That's the Sea of Galilee. He revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called twin Nathaniel from Cana of Galilee, Zebedee's sons, And two others of the disciples were together. I'm going fishing, Simon Peter said to them. We're coming with you, they told him. When they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. When daybreak came, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Friends, Jesus called to them. You don't have any fish, do you? No, they answered. Cast the net on the right side of the boat, he told them, and you'll find some. So they did, and they were unable to haul it in because of the large number of fish. The disciple, the one Jesus loved, said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he tied his um, outer clothing around him, for he had taken it off and plunged into the sea. Since they were not far from land, about a hundred yards away, the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the full net of fish. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish lying on it and bread. 
Bring some of the fish you've just caught, Jesus told them. So Simon Peter climbed up and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. Even though there were so many, the net was not torn. Come and have breakfast, Jesus told them. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Let us pray. Father, this is an amazing passage. There's so many things going on there here that we sometimes just skip over and forget. And we don't pay attention sometimes when we read this passage. And I just pray, God, that you will just bring this message into our hearts and our minds, God. And that you will speak to us about what you want us to know about you and about what our role is in this commission that you've given everyone to go and share the gospel with all those we come in contact. I pray, God, this message will be coming from you and not from me. I pray, God, that everyone here will hear this and have it applied to their own situation in life, that they can go out of here after the service, share their, the gospel, be enriched, uh, be equipped to do so. We thank you for your many blessings. In your name we pray. Amen. So, you know, last week we learned that the Jesus gave his disciples four simple but profound promises. Remember, we're kind of looking back last week, they received the peace of God. That was the first thing. Remember, Jesus appears to Thomas and says, peace be with you. The second one is they have a mission to go and share the good news. So Jesus says, I want you to go and I want you to share this good news with anyone you come in contact with. But you're not going to have to do this on your own. The third one was they would receive the Holy Spirit. Remember, Jesus breathes the Holy Spirit upon them, and now they are equipped. They have the counselor, the one who will equip them to bring this message to others. They're not alone in this process. The Holy Spirit will empower and equip them in this mission. The fourth thing was they have been given ministerial authority from Jesus to do this. So if someone comes in and says, why are you doing this? Under whose authority are you saying this? They can say, under Jesus' authority, the one who was raised from the dead. This is why we're bringing this message. And we have authority to do this. So in our text today, Jesus will be doing um, some things. He's going to be illustrating some of these promises and exhortations by living them out in their very lives. See, this text is not just about Jesus hanging out with the disciples and having fish. There's more going on here than meets the eye. Jesus never misses an opportunity. Anytime you read through the Gospels, Jesus never misses an opportunity to teach somebody something. Whether it's through a meal, whether it's healing someone, whether it's um, exercising a demon, whatever it is, Jesus is always using his time with them to teach them something. To teach them something new. And Jesus wants them to realize, to understand and believe in their whole heart, mind, and soul that their mission is to do what? To participate in the resurrection life by fulfilling the mission Jesus has for them. That's the beauty of the Christian life. That Jesus doesn't just say, hey, I'm going to do all this and you can sit down and do nothing. What does Jesus do? He says, I'm going to go and I'm going to ascend to the Father, but I'm going to bring you one who will equip you to do the mission I gave you. Jesus gives them a commission to spread the good news everywhere, and he gives them the Holy Spirit to do this. So the disciples' job really is to participate in this mission. And by extension, we, all of us, are to go and share this good news with others. And so Jesus is sharing this message, and he does it through a conversation over fish and bread. He's commissioning them to spread this good news. And so Jesus has risen from the dead, and he's going to soon ascend to heaven and sit at his right hand of God in glorious triumph. He has raised from the dead, but he spends 40 days appearing to people all over Jerusalem and equipping them through the Spirit to do this mission. He doesn't leave them by themselves. One of the most freeing things that I have ever heard from someone about the Christian life is they said, you cannot live the Christian life in your own power. You can only live it through the power of the Spirit. 
See, some of us are kind of trying to lift ourselves up by our own bootstraps and trying to do the thing that God is actually wants to do through you. We want to lift ourselves up and we want to do all those things that God has given us. We say, hey God, I thank you for saving me. I thank you for that wonderful blessing, but I've got it from here on out. Or we think that that's what God actually wants us to do. I've saved you, now you need to go and live the Christian life. And Jesus says, no, that's why I'm bringing you the counselor, because you can't do it on your own. It's impossible. So what happens is is that now is the time for these disciples to fulfill their true purpose in life. And it's amazing what goes on here. They have now been have a part to play in this greatest story ever told. They're not just kind of bystanders of what happened, that Jesus gives them a role to do and to accomplish. So they and us, by extension, we too now have a mission. And what is that mission? to proclaim the good news of Jesus in word and deed to the world. Through our words, through our deeds, we bring the gospel message to all those we come in contact with. A quote um, kind of attributed to Francis Sissy used to say that you can spread the gospel, use words if necessary. What did he mean by that? That you could spread the gospel message by how you live your life in society. People will see that you are one with Jesus, that you are have the Holy Spirit living through you by what you're doing in life, how you conduct your businesses, how you interact with your loved ones, how you interact with your coworkers, people outside of church, Non-believers, believers, people of different faith, how do you interact with them shares a lot about how you value the gospel and how you live out that gospel message. As one commentator beautifully sums this up, he says, the life and ministry of Jesus is present in and empowering the life and ministry of the church whose mission is to participate in the ongoing mission of God to the world. For it is the church where the presence and purposes of God are made manifest. That is the whole purpose of church, that we will be a light shining on a city for the world. That people will look at the church and say, I can't wait to be and join them because they are spreading this good news. And they're just different than all of us. They have a light and joy and peace about them that we can't understand. And how does that happen? That doesn't happen because we pull up our boots and try to do it on our own power. How does it happen? It happens as we participate with the spirit who resides in us. So let's look a little bit more closely on how Jesus teaches them even more lessons by interacting with them during breakfast. Breakfast is a great time to teach someone something. Why? Because they've got food in their bellies and they're able to listen to what you're saying. Some of the best conversations I've had have been over breakfast. Look at verses 1 and 2. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to his disciples by the, sea of, by the Sea of Tiberias. He revealed himself in this way. Simon, Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, Zebedee's sons, and the two others of the disciples were together. Jesus has this third appearance with them. He wants to share this good news with them. But this time, it's not behind a locked door. Remember last time, the disciples were scared to death, thinking that the Jewish authorities were going to come and round them up and have send them off to the Romans to be crucified, just like Jesus was. If there's one thing that the Romans hate is when the status quo is not going the status quo way. And when that doesn't happen, what they do is they squash it. And so Jesus is calling a rebellion. Let's crucify him. And let's get all, round up all his fellow followers and have them killed as well. That's what they were thinking. So Jesus appears to them behind a closed door. And the amazing thing about this text as we move into John 21 is now he appears to them outside. So because Jesus has appeared to them and has shown up and says, I'm the Messiah, I have risen from the dead, here I am, they're not afraid anymore. They're not cowering in fear in a locked room. They're outside doing what they normally do. Something has changed in them. 
They're not cowering. They want to go out. They want to do whatever they've been called to do. And some of them just say, hey, I'm going to go back to living my life how I used to live because I know that Jesus has risen from the dead. They're still wondering what their commission is. They're wondering what they're supposed to do. They know that they're supposed to share this gospel, but how do they do that? But the first step was getting outside, getting away from this locked room. And so Jesus meets them in the world where they're living. And so have the disciples begun to understand their mission in life? Do they now feel comfortable to share this Or do they want to go back to their normal task and kind of say, that was a great experience, but now what? I think one of the things here that Jesus wants them to do is say, hey, why does he show up again? He wants them to say is that I'm here. You're not just going to be able to go back to life and have things the way they used to be. No, I'm giving you a mission. And this mission is to proclaim the good news through the Spirit. See, Jesus has been risen from the dead, and so what they're supposed to do is bring this message to others. Look at verse 3. Peter says, I'm going fishing. He doesn't want to be in a locked room anymore. He wants to go fishing. He's a fisherman. That's what he does. So he wants to go back, and he wants to fish. He says, and the disciples, they're not cowering in fear anymore. They go, I'm coming with you. We're going to go. Let's do this together. Let's have some fun. Let's go out, and let's go fishing. Why? Because Jesus has raised from the dead. They went out, they got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Peter's done hiding. He doesn't want to hide anymore. He's finished with cowering in a corner because Jesus has risen from the dead. He's not in fear anymore. He's been invigorated by the appearance of Jesus. He has a new purpose. He is, not exci- he is not wondering what's going to happen. He is excited. He wants to get out and do something. So what does he naturally do? He, he goes fishing. I'm going to go fishing. I'm going to go catch some fish. I'm going to have a meal. I'm going to be excited, and then I'm going to get energy so that I can go out and proclaim this message. See, remember, that is where Jesus first found them at the beginning of the ministry. This, is, this whole story has become bookended. Remember, Jesus in the beginning of his ministry says to them, I will make you fishers of men. You come follow me. Now he's doing what? He's watching them fish, and now he's going to cook them a meal so they can go out and fish for other people. This whole story has come full circle. The disciples are still learning about what it means that Jesus has risen from the dead, but the fact that Peter has taken a positive step and goes fishing is a good sign. I'm going fishing. We're coming with you, they told him. They went out and got into the boat that night, and they caught nothing. So the disciples go out, but you know, they're now ready to go outside and do stuff, but they don't have much luck catching fish, and for a fisherman not to catch fish is not a very good day. Look at verse 4. When daybreak came, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples said, did not know it was Jesus, friends. Some texts may have children here. Jesus called to them, you don't have any fish, do you? No, they answered. The fact that the disciples could not catch any fish is not a simple thing. It's not like, hey, they just went out and they couldn't catch fish. There's more going on here because the last time they tried to catch fish, they couldn't catch anything, and Jesus had to catch their fish for them by making fish appear. So this is amazing passage is that what's going on here is that Jesus is saying, friends or even children, you are babies in this mission. You can't just go out and do whatever you think you can do just because you've seen me. You're still in a time of learning. You're infants in this process. And so they go out and they think they can fish, but you know what? They can't. They find out they can't really do much of anything without Jesus being with them, without his presence. See, the amazing thing here is that Jesus wants them to understand that apart from him, they cannot do this mission. They can't even catch fish. See, while their relationship with Jesus has grown in this time because Jesus has risen from the dead, the text is pretty clear that they're still dependent on him. Friends, 
Jesus called to them, why don't you have any fish? Do you? You don't have any fish, do you? You haven't caught anything. What's going on here? See, Jesus wants them to realize that they cannot do it without them. Jesus knows that they have not caught any fish, so he does what? He helps them out. Look at verse 6. So Jesus says, you haven't caught anything? Let me show you what's going to happen when you trust in me. So what I want you to do is I want you to cast out your nets on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. So you think, well, okay, they're going to find a couple fish that they're going to have breakfast that morning. So they do. They cast their net over the side of the boat, and they were unable to haul it in because of the large number of fish. They went from not catching anything to barely being able to get their net back on the boat because it was full of fish. What happened? Jesus showed up. The message here is that we can't do anything without his power and influence. You want to share the gospel and bring others to faith. You don't do that through your own power. You do it through his. The disciples went from catching nothing to catching so many fish they could barely get it on to the boat. Look at 7 and 8. Disciple, the one Jesus loved, so this is John here, said to Peter, it's the Lord. He says, it's the Lord, it's Jesus. This is the third disciple who have said the same kind of thing. My Lord, my God, it, it is the Lord. It's someone who is, um, Jesus has appeared before us. He is the Messiah. He is the Lord of the world. So when, what ha- next verse is amazing. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he tied his outer clothes around him so he wouldn't lose it, and he jumps in the water. And he wants to swim to shore because he just can't wait to be in the presence of Jesus. Now, the text says that he was about a thousand, uh, sorry, a hundred yards away. Now, you think a hundred yards isn't that far, but if you've ever tried, if you've ever swam in a lap pool, a 25 meter pool, that's four laps back and forth. So it's not like a very short distance. It's a pretty far distance to swim in the middle of a pond in the, in the morning when you're still wet from fish and probably have all your, your, your clothes on. You're not sure how to get there. So this wasn't like they were walking from here to the end of the stage swimming. This was a pretty far distance. And Peter doesn't care. He wants to go see Jesus. He would have swam five miles if Jesus was on shore. They can't wait to be with Jesus. See, John is the one here who says, it is the Lord. And John is so excited to be with him, and so he doesn't want to do, but Peter just can't wait. He gets up, and he jumps in the water, and he swims to shore. What the amazing thing here is that if you have been paying attention in the text here in the last couple weeks, you'll notice that each time there's an appearance, there's joy in these people's Hearts. First, a couple of weeks ago, we learned that Mary Magdalene had finally realized that Jesus was there, that he had appeared, that he rose from the dead. And what does she say? I have seen the Lord. Next, Thomas, after seeing the Lord and touching Jesus' scar, says, My Lord and my God. Two people have finally realize who Jesus is, that he is the Lord, he's the one who rose from the dead. Now John shouts for joy, it is the Lord. Three of the disciples have made this distinction and said, he is the Lord, it's Jesus. It's not some sort of floating apparition who's feeding his fish. This is Jesus. This is the one that we spent the last three years following. We know him. He is risen from the dead. It's changed their whole perspective on life. Look at verses 9 through 11. When they they got out on land, they saw a charcoal file there with fish lying on it and bread. Bring some of the fish you've just caught, Jesus told them. So Simon Peter climbed up and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. Even though they were so many, the net was not torn. What is going on here? There's more than just, hey, they got on the boat and they got fish and they started. There's more going on here than meets the eye. First of all, Jesus had already started breakfast. He's already um, feeding them. He's already getting them going. He's serving them. Jesus didn't come back to say, hey, I've risen from the dead. Check it out, everybody. Look at me. 
I'm here. What does he do? He gets on his hands and knees and he starts cooking them breakfast. He serves them. He wants them to know that your job is not to run around and celebrate that the fact that Jesus is risen from the dead. Your job is to serve other people. Your job is to take this message to other people and serve them, just like I have served you. I washed your feet in the upper room. I'm with you now. I'm going to cook you breakfast. This next part, bring some of the fish you have. Jesus said, so Simon Peter climbed up and hauled the net ashore. What's going on here? Peter, where they could, all the disciples had to lift the net up to get it in the boat. Now Peter's just dragging the net like this, the 153 fish in them. How much did that weigh? I have no idea, but it must have been pretty heavy. Wet fish weigh a lot. And there's 150 of three of them, but the net didn't break. See, Jesus was maintaining the fact that Peter was going to be able to carry this load as well as the net didn't break. So what's happening here? Jesus is sustaining what they just caught. See, Jesus wants them to be fishers of people. And he's going to help them to sustain them in this process. This is not just catching fish. This is a mission for the whole world that if you remain in me, you will be able to present and share this good news with others. And I will keep it so that you will be able to do this and others will learn about how to do this as well. See, this is an amazing concept here that there's more going on than fishing. Jesus serves them by cooking them breakfast. The fire had already started. All he needs is some of the fish they've caught. The disciples are beginning to learn that apart from Jesus, they can do nothing. They didn't catch anything. They're not cooking anything. They can't carry the load without him doing it. They bring Jesus the fish that they caught, even though it was really the fish that Jesus caught. I love this. Bring some of the fish you just caught. Verse 10. Wait a second. Jesus caught the fish, right? He's the one who said, just throw your net over and bring it up and you're going to have fish. So, and Jesus miraculously is the one who put fish in their net. But what does Jesus say? Bring some of the fish you just caught. Jesus is saying here that even though that I have empowered you to do this, even though I have made this scenario happen, you're the one who still obeyed me. You're the one who still put your net over the side. You're still the one who hauled it in, and you are obeying what I'm telling you, and you're going to what? Reap the benefits. It's not them doing it. It's Jesus. So they obey what Jesus says, and they get the blessing. So this is an amazing concept. They bring Jesus the fish they caught, even though Jesus was the real fisherman in this story. See, remember, Jesus' ministry to them begins with the meal at the beginning of John's gospel in John 2. They have a what? Jesus turns water into wine at a wedding, a feast that probably went on for a week. And so Jesus begins his whole ministry with them at a meal. Now he ends his time with them at a meal as well. There's something that amazing that happens over a meal. When two people, three people, a group of people get together and have a meal, something amazing happens. People interact with each other. They talk. They share stories. When you bring food into conversation, something miraculous happens. It's amazing what happens when you have meals with others. So the disciples would do what? They would go on to do many other things by the power of the Holy Spirit. Go read the book of Acts. The book of Acts story is all about what happens when the disciples focus on the Holy Spirit and allow him to do the work. So they're following Jesus' example of service. They were now discipleship begins with service to others. You want to make disciples, you serve them firsthand. Jesus is always serving people in his gospel. He's always meeting their needs first. Think of verses 12 through 14. So Jesus says, come and have breakfast. Jesus told them, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. 
They're not going to say, hey, Jesus, are you, are you sure it's you? Can I see your scars again? No, this is the third time Jesus has appeared to them. If they haven't gotten it at this point, they just don't want to get it at all. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So this story ends with a celebratory meal. Go back and read this gospel. There's similarities between this meal and two other ones that are shared in this entire gospel. Remember the feeding of the 5,000 in John 6? That was over fish and bread as well. Then you have John 13 with the Lord's Supper, another meal. Jesus serves them food every single time. See, again, there's no doubt from the story that Jesus has risen from the dead and the era of new creation has begun. Jesus is sharing to them that there is a new chief in town and he works under a different system of laws. He is bringing the new creation to the world and he's saying that anyone who becomes part of that family is what? A new creation. Therefore, the new creation has come. Those who are part of me you are now a new creation. It's a paraphrase from Paul. 2 Corinthians 5.17. The start of the Jesus' mission here to them has begun. The disciples are ready now to go out and do this work. Jesus is now serving them. So just one last thing that Jesus needs to do is to, Peter needs reaffirmation. And we'll talk about that next week. So what we have learned from studying this story in John 21, first that, and foremost that the disciples have been commissioned by Jesus. They have been given a job to do. And this job has been given to them, not saying, hey, go do it on your own power. No, they've been given the word and they've been given the spirit to do this. So their job is to participate in this mission. Participate. That's our job, to participate with what God is doing in the world, to get on board, to join up, to sign up for it, get involved. So we too have been given this commission by the church. The nature of participation is threefold. We'll look at this. First thing is that we have been commissioned to catch people for Jesus. Jesus tells them, you will be fishers of people. Catching fish is a huge theme throughout this gospel and the other ones. And so what does Jesus want us to do now is to go out and catch people for him. Jesus begins his ministry with the disciples by telling them he will make them fishers of people. So he reiterates this ministry to them by doing what? Not by giving them a Sunday school class, but by actually catching fish and having a meal with them. He's showing them how you do this. You serve them. Jesus chooses to serve them through a meal and also to help them catch fish. And so what he wants them to do is now go out and serve others. See, Jesus' food choices here are not coincidences. Jesus will make them fishers of people. Why? Because he is the bread of life. That's not a coincidence. The second thing is that this commission of the disciples and by extension the church is the work of God. Jesus wants us to participate in his work. And that's the big focus here is it's his work, not ours. We are just participating in it. So when the Holy Spirit tells you to go do something, you are participating in what he's about to do. Three, this great commission will only be successful if we remain Jesus talks in John 15 about remaining in me, right? The vine and the branches. You, you can't have those things without them remaining in each other. So to remain in the presence of Christ. Well, how do you explain, what does it mean to remain in Jesus? Think about a turtle. Have you ever seen a turtle out of its shell? It's not a good thing. It's, a turtle is not having a good day when a turtle is you know, out of its shell. So in order for a turtle really to survive, it has to remain in its shell. If it's not, something's going on that's not a good sign for the turtle. And so what Jesus is saying here is you need to remain in me. Stick close to me and you'll be okay. You wander away and things aren't going to go so well. 
See, while the church is called to faithful to participate in this great mission of God for the world, the church's success in this mission is entirely dependent on him. It's his church, it's his mission, it's his spirit, it's his people who are coming to faith. Our job is just to participate in that process. So let me give you a fishing illustration to illustrate this point, then we'll move on. When I was a kid, I got, um, my dad and I um, sent, uh, we had, he some frequent flower miles he had to use. And so we went to Key West on a fishing trip. And so they rented out kind of a fishing charter. And if you've ever been on one of those, usually they just have a, a team of professional fishermen that know what they're doing. And they just supply everything. And you fish and you catch fish. And you think you're really good at it because you're not doing much of anything other than casting out and reeling in. Right, but I wanted to, I was young, and so I wanted to figure out how to bait and hook my own rod. So I'm trying to figure it out as a young kid, and I'm waiting and trying to figure out for about 15 minutes, and I can't get the little worm on top of the hook and then bait my hook and get it ready to cast out in the ocean. Meanwhile, all the men around me and their wives and my dad are just catching fish, doing it real easy, no problem. And I decided to, I was doing something wrong, and it finally dawned on me that I really didn't have to do anything. See, the whole point of us spending money to go on a fishing charter was so that the guys in the boat would do everything. All I had to do was follow the, their, their lead, do what they told me to do. They equipped me with everything I needed to be a good fisherman, and I didn't know anything about being a fisherman. I couldn't reel my own line. I couldn't figure out how to cast it out. I'm a young kid. I'm not sure what to do. So they would help me catch fish. What they would do is they would hand you a whole rod completely ready to go with its hook and bait ready to go. And all you had to do is grab it out of their hand and cast out. And that was the end of it. And about three seconds later, a fish would bite and you would reel it in. And if you couldn't, they would come and help you reel it in. So this is what is going on here is that for four hours, I did this. And my dad and I caught 100 fish that day. It was an amazing day, an experience I'll never forget. I learned a lot about myself and about fishing that day. And I realized that when it came to fishing, I had to just follow the teachers because they knew what they were doing. They had equipped us with every single thing that we needed to be good fishermen. You see, this is what Jesus wants us to realize, and he wants Jesus, and Jesus wanted the disciples to realize this, that as Christians, he has equipped us with everything we need to become fishers of people. And we're trying to do it in our own power. Why isn't this not working? I'm casting out my line. I can't bait my hook. Uh, Jesus and says, hey, I can, I can take it from here. I know how to do this. No, I've got it. You've saved me. Everything's going to be fine. Jesus, I can do this under my own power. And we wonder why things are not moving the way we think they should. Or why we're not growing in our Christian life because we are trying to do it on our own power. And that's not something that Jesus ever wanted us to do in the Christian life. We have been commissioned with a mission to go and proclaim the good news of Jesus to the world and make disciples. If Jesus can train a ragtag bag of disciples who would change the world in 40 years, he can equip us to do the same thing. We don't need to wait to get our act together. If we wait to get our act together, we're going to be waiting for the end of time because we're never going to be ready in our own power to do this mission. We're never going to be holy enough to do this. We're never going to be good enough to do this. We're never going to be equipped with all the skills to do it. So what does Jesus want us to do? Jesus, I don't know what to do. Help me. Show me how to do this. Show me how to be a Christian. Show me how to share the love of God with other people. Show me how to pray. Show me how to be close to other people and love others. That is what Jesus wants us to do. He's there. That's why he sent the Holy Spirit. 
so that our life would just be a reflection of his ministry to other people. That's the blessing about being a Christian. Jesus is saying, what I did is what I want you to go do. So are we disciples who are serving other people? Are we out there? Are we interacting with others? See, what I'm talking about, sometimes we look at service as something big and flashy that we need to do, and what does Jesus really want us to do? To go and interact with people. Serve somebody a meal. Eat with somebody that you don't know. Call somebody and interact with them on the phone. Sometimes somebody just might need counseling. Little things that sometimes we forget to do as Christians. What would we need to do to make this kind of service in our life happen? What are things that are happening in our life that are challenging us to doing things simple as eating with someone, calling someone on the phone, sending somebody a card and saying, I'm here if you need to talk. That's what Jesus did. He went around Israel and interacted with people on a personal basis. He didn't have a rock concert. He didn't have a huge following and say, hey, come on out. I'm going to have a, a huge raffle party and all of you can come and hang out. He didn't send out flyers and say, hey, I'm going to have a sermon on Mount on Thursday and you, you can be included in this process. No, he just went around and ministered to people. And people came to him because he was sharing the love of his message with others. He didn't need to draw a crowd. A crowd came to him because of what he was doing in life. People could just not understand that someone would come and bring the blessings that he was bringing and actually love people the way he was loving them. And they wanted to just come and see what this person was doing. What can we do to help each other in this process in terms of the needs that we may have in this community? People that may need a phone call or may need a food sent to them or a conversation on the phone or a a card or any of these little things that we can do. Even things as simple as calling someone and saying, hey, I know maybe we feel uncomfortable with this whole COVID thing, but let's have dinner together, but let's do it through a Zoom conversation. Let's have a conversation. Or maybe we feel like we are able to do those other things in terms of having a conversation, but we can get creative in this process. Maybe there's somebody this week that you need to talk with. And if there's not, then pray. Holy Spirit, who do you want me to minister to this week? Whether in my family, in the workplace, the places I hang out at church, wherever it is in my communion, who do you want me to minister to this week? And equip me to do this. Equip me to how to say things, how to interact with them, what to say, what not to say, and go from there. So I challenge you this week to connect with someone that needs it in whatever possible way you feel most comfortable with. Let's pray. Father, there's one amazing message here in this passage in John 21 that just something as simple as eating food with each other and interacting, that Jesus can serve them in the midst of this crazy experience that they're having about casting out their net and next, next thing they know they're getting all these fish and having a meal with him and seeing him for the third time risen from the dead. And I just pray, God, that this message will soak into our our very hearts and we'll understand that we have been equipped with every single thing that we need in his spirit to do the commission that he has called us to do. In your name we pray, amen.